Good morning and thank you for joining us. This is Barbara Winters, Vice President of Marketing with HG Data. I'm here to introduce Mark Godley, our Chief Revenue Officer, who will be sharing our webinar, How to Turn Data into Sales. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Barbara, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this topic that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have made a career in the last decade of helping technology startups get into revenue. I'm somehow drawn to these very embryonic early stage companies that have great ideas, but uh, not many clients. Um, right now I do work for HC Data, um, which uh, is an organiz organization that um, is at the forefront of uh, helping evolve the sales and marketing arenas uh, to be more uh, science oriented and those that are moving into the predictive analytics and the um, the ABM worlds uh, are finding that the data set that HE data has built uh, can, can be of significant value um, which leads to what we're going to talk about today this is going to be very much a personal perspective on the hype uh, that is around ABM and predictive analytics right now. I'm certainly gonna share with you HG Data's perspective on it, um, give you some real world exam examples that draw upon my past and, and what we've seen uh, at HG Data, uh, certainly then uh, lead into a, a short and brief shameless plug uh, of HG Data at the end of the discussion, and then lead into our Q&A. Hopefully we'll have a, a vibrant discussion of, of what topics are of interest uh, to all of you listening today. Um, as I said a minute ago, um, sales and marketing is really going through a uh, transition from, from art to science. Uh, Data-driven uh, is all the new rage. You go Google, Google that right now, and you'll find um, you know, tens of millions of hits about data-driven marketing and data-driven sales and, and all different uh, focuses on how data should be the underpinnings of, of how you approach the market. Uh, what's interesting from my perspective is um, we're really going from an environment of scarcity of information to one of abundance. And to some degree, um, you know, having uh, this blizzard of information is actually a, a scarier world. 20 years ago, when you didn't know who to call, who to talk to, how to figure out your addressable market, um, you, it, it was kind of easy because, you know, you could only find, uh, you had a paucity of leads. And so you would obviously go reach out to them. But now with all these tools that are in all this data that's allowing you to slice and dice and analyze your market in a, in a plethora of different ways, it's actually more, uh, it, it's almost a bit numbing or, or paralyzing because you can actually look at the market in so many different uh, fashions. So, um, not only do you need to listen uh, to the data, as this, this quote uh, talks about, but you need to figure out what subset of the data is, in, of data is important for you to pay attention to. So that in the blizzard of information, finding the, the nuggets of value is what all of us um, in the sales and marketing arenas uh, now aspire to do. Um, surely in the last year, you, you've heard the term ABM, uh, and for those few on the phone that maybe haven't heard it, heard it that stands for um, account-based marketing. Um, it's all the rage, and I think generally that's a good thing. What, what isn't a good thing is just about every MarTech and sales tech vendor that's been around for years in the last year has changed their website to say, we're the key to your ABM strategy. So what's happened is, you know, a concept um, that is taking hold right now um, is, is being confused or cluttered by everyone latching onto it uh, by saying, we're your ABM solution. Um, so to define ABM a, a little bit from, from my perspective, uh, and there are other vendors that can give you a much more comprehensive definition of ABM, I'll just define it very um, simply, which is uh, ABM 
is about targeting accounts with precision. It's about a rifle approach to how you define your market rather than a shotgun approach. But there's a key concept here. It's about pre precision at scale. And a, a key thing for, I want you to walk away from this discussion um, having uh, it, it, it internalized is years ago, having precision and scale was not possible. Um, they were oxymoronic. You could have one or the other. You could either target effectively and have an addressable market of five, or you could go after hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of prospects, but you had no ability to target them effectively. What we can now do because of the addition of data into the mix um, is you can actually have both precision and scale. Um, you know, my personal opinion is ABM is uh, also the pendulum swinging back from the belief that many of us fell victim to um, in the last decade that all you have to do is buy a, a, a email tool such as marketing automation. Um, you can start sending out tens of thousands of emails, create these very um, elaborate nurture campaigns, and all of a sudden your phone's gonna start ringing and POs are gonna start showing up uh, at your door. Uh, many of us are now a bit hungover from that never having been, uh, been in fact true. Um, and this old tactic of being very prescriptive, actually, um, you know, a term that, that I've used in some of my, some, some of the, the evangelical work that I've done about whale hunting. Um, this is really about before you reach out to a company or, or decide a company is, is part of your addressable market, um, doing a fair amount of analysis to know that, that there is a business need at that entity that your product or service addresses. Um, here's the predicament that all of us are in. Um, if you want to be data driven, if you want to, to institute ABM strategies, if you want to be effective with predictive analytics, all of that is predicated on your systems of record being both accurate and complete. Now, just like I said a minute ago, um, that uh, precision and scale were oftentimes the antithesis of each other. The two words I just used a second ago historically have been uh, at opposition to one another. I use the words accurate and complete. Anybody listening to this webinar that can tell me they work for a company whose CRM is both complete and accurate, I want you to contact me after this webinar because I'd like to see it. <laughs> I've never seen it. Uh, I don't see it today. Uh, it's something that I think all of us are trying to figure out um, uh, as we move forward into this data-rich uh, ABM world. But, but I will say that strive towards the goal of accuracy and completeness is the first step you have to take um, to be effective uh, in being data-driven, in being predictive, in, in pursuing uh, ABM strategies. Now, here, here's some good news. Um, Third-party vendors, whether they be predictive analytics companies or ABM workflow solutions or, shameless plug, third-party data companies are absolutely a major um, component that you should consider embracing to help, help get you closer to that nirvana of an accurate and complete system of record. Um, again, a quick clarification. HG Data is not a predictive analytics vendor. We are not a, uh, an ABM vendor. Uh, we do fuel a lot of those vendors themselves. Um, we are a major component that those vendors uh, have brought to market to ensure that they can augment your database with the best, most accurate, most comprehensive, most actionable data. And we do have a vibrant set of direct customers 
that have the, that have sophistication in in munging third party data sets with first party data and making it actionable. So um, I, I've hit some of these points uh, in that prior slide, but um, the days of first party data, uh, and by first party data, what I mean by that is information that you can glean from your clients, information that exists currently in your data set, it's, it's existing data set in your systems of record. It's, it's information that, that your prospects are filling out in form fill. It's information you can glean from website visits, uh, from known visitors, et cetera. The days of, of that information being enough, kind of like your mom loves you. We all know your mom loves you, but at some point in our life, we have to get beyond that. <laughs> So um, all of us in our, in, our, in our corporate evolution have to get beyond us loving our own products. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is to augment um, your first party data um, with third party data. And eventually, it's not just about the data. It's about having a consistent data append, data hygiene, data cleanse, and analytics layer on top of whatever systems you're using, whether they be on the marketing automation side of, of the world or the sales side of the world. And, and let me give you um, two real world uh, examples um, that I think will, will, if any of you are feeling intimidated by what I've described or feeling like this is just too difficult to road or, or my CRM looks like that, that, uh, that image I just showed a couple slides back. The good news is you're not the exception, you're the rule, and all of us are going on this journey together. So the first example I wanna give you is a Fortune 100 tech, tech company. It is a company all of you will absolutely recognize. I would, I would guess that all of you are using this company's systems on a daily basis but because I don't have the rights to disclose the logo and I would not want to embarrass the particular company, uh, I'm not going to tell you who it is. I think you just need to trust me that this is real data and this is a real scenario. As a matter of fact, this is a scenario from September of 2016. So this is not the distant past. This is current. Um, and this is a company that makes some of the most sophisticated technologies in the world. Again, my guess is by the time you end today, you have used some of that um, that company's, uh, some of their software or hardware. Now, like the cobbler's children not having shoes, their internal systems that define their go-to-market go strategy are less than world-class. <laughs> um, matter of fact, when we started by we, I mean HG Data, started an engagement with this entity, they were very, very proud that their, um, uh, that their systems of record, which, which comprised both their marketing automation platform and their CRM, comprised and synced back and forth um, information on over one million distinct companies. Now, here's the problem with that. The problem with that is if you talked to the people who were responsible for, for market analytics at, the, at, at this entity, which was a distinct business unit that, that had as an internal customer, both the marketing and sales group, they would tell you that the verified targeted accounts within that 1.04 million companies was only 32,000, okay? So they had this enormous system but I, I can't do math in my head very much anymore now that I'm in my late 40s. Um, whatever that percentage is, only 32,000 uh, 32, uh, uh, of a million um, were um, what they would consider a viable prospect. Now, now, here's the crazy part about this. I hope you're sitting down right now. We ask them, what was your criteria for coming up with that 32,000? And they gave us a laundry list of, oh, it has to have this much revenue and be in this industry. And they gave us a whole bunch of other stuff. 
and we actually use use that criteria to help them appreciate that there actually were 40,000 other companies not in their original 1.04 million targets, not encapsulated in, in the 32,000 subset of that 1.04 million, that were net new opportunities to them. And we showed them those 40,000 companies and everyone across the organization, the analytics team, the marketing team, the sales team said, son of a gun, you're right. There are, we had a blind spot of 40,000 companies we didn't know about because we weren't incorporating third-party data in an effective fashion. And by the way, again, this is, this is the exception. This is the rule, not the exception. Whenever we do this kind of analysis with the biggest and brightest and most sophisticated marketing organizations on the planet, they are consistently blind to, I am comfortable on this call that will eventually be recorded saying that 30% of their addressable market, they are consistently blind to. In this case, I think the math is uh, four of them. I it's, it's easily over 50%, 50 probably over 60% of their market they were blind to. That is consistently the case. So don't be feeling intimidated, embarrassed, bad about if any of what I'm telling you today hits close to home. Um, it is the norm for all of us. Matter of fact, speaking of us, let me give you an exact example from my past. Now, this example is four years old um, because I've been at HG Data three years. But um, uh, at a prior company, I was brought in um, in a really neat role. It was almost a consulting role where I, I reported to the CEO, but I had authority across the product team, the sales team, and the marketing team. My charter at this company, I, I, it was a venture-backed entity. I was brought in by the venture capital folks to accelerate the growth of the company. Um, and so I kind of had this neat role of being able to kind of be a free agent and move fluidly between these departments. Um, I met with the marketing team, and the marketing team was incredibly proud, just like that prior example, of the size of their database. Um, but what we found was that, that the size of that database was actually uh, a, a hindrance to the demand gen and the sales organizations. Um, they were being overwhelmed on a daily basis by a blizzard of bad information coming out of that marketing group. That bad information was people that no longer worked at those companies, bad phone numbers, bad um, uh, emails, stale information. And so by the time we were done with reviewing the impact this had, what finally got the attention of the organization is we believe that 70% of the, of the activities initiated by sales or demand gen was being uh, heard was being um, impacted neg negatively, was being held back, were dead ends because they were starting with bad information. 70% of their activities was impacted by bad information. It could be as simple as generating a calling list of 100 people that they wanted to talk to only to find out that 30% 30, uh, 30 of them uh, were contacts that were no longer at the company or or bad phone numbers, et cetera. You, you get the idea of what, I, what I'm getting at here. So one of the first things we did was we went into uh, an analysis of the underlying data set that the company was working off of. And we literally deleted 90% of the CRM. I'm not kidding you. I, I actually was the person that hit the delete key um, and deleted, by the way, full disclosure, we did export it to a to to a Excel file. We did have a backup of it, okay. But reps went home on a Friday. They and their database was X large. They came in on Monday. The database was ninety percent small. And you can imagine the reaction I got from the sales leadership who was responsible for quota, saying, "Godly, what are you doing here? You, you're going to absolutely destroy us as a business." Well. And by the way, this was a career, this was a job making bet I was making at this company, where if this ended up failing, 
I would probably be working somewhere else. If this was successful, the company would, would get on a, a, a path of, of significant growth. You can, you can see you know, basically what happened on this chart. Um, the, the net of it is we had a 5X increase uh, in 90 days in pipeline, in, in SQL conversion, in pipeline creation. It eventually resulted in much better close ratios. So a 9X reduction uh, in the addressable market resulted in a 5X increase in pipeline creation. So I beat the horse dead. Um, uh, I think you hopefully are starting to get the theme of, of what is important to me personally and uh, what HG data uh, certainly fills some of the need of, which is quality data is an accelerant to your predictive analytics and your ABM strategies. Now, now two side notes that um, before we move to Q&A that, that I do want to, to mention here um, that are derivative of if you pursue a strategy similar to what I've suggested here. Um, uh, the first thing is your sales funnel will change, the shape of your sales funnel will change significantly if you start taking a more qualitative ABM analytics approach to your marketing and sales efforts. Um, the one on the left is typically what you see in most organizations, which you have this very wide and deep funnel. What that basically means is the sales team um, has a false sense of security because what they're doing is they're not qualifying out early in the process and they're carrying forward to the late stages um, of, uh, uh, of an engagement, a bunch of deals that they know darn well are never gonna close. So every organization I've gone to, I have tr aspired to a sales funnel such as the one on the right, which is shorter, which means less time, okay? So you're getting to yeses and nos much more quickly. And secondly, it's much more narrow. So what you're seeing here is at the first stage of the sales cycle, we are qualifying out very aggressively. We're qualifying out by doing analytics on uh, SQLs. And we are having a team independent of the sales rep qualify uh, accounts out. What happens here is the reps are scared to death because um, in, in, the, in the funnel on the left, they may eventually close only 20% of their late stage deals. In, in the funnel on the right, they need to close 60, 70% of their late stage deals. But here's the beautiful part about this. Because you're qualifying out early, 90% of the rep's time is spent with a smaller corpus, a smaller cohort of accounts but because they're more highly qualified, that's time well spent. You're actually gonna close larger deals, quicker deals, because you're getting rid of um, that false sense of security by carrying garbage very deep into your sales cycle. Other point, um, and this is really a prerequisite for, uh, for embarking on any of these strategies, if you're listening to this uh, on a mar you know on a marketing in a mar marketing organization or sales organization, and you don't have engineering quality uh, staff that report to you, um, you need to reconsider that. Um, technical resources in the marketing and sales organization, I believe are the next wave of growth um, for us to be successful in barking on these very data-driven, science-oriented analytics strategies to be effective. So we all need quasi-engineer, coder-level folks um, that are probably designing your product in the back room, but they also need to understand markets. They need to understand the competitive landscape. They need to understand the buyer's journey. They need to understand the competitive landscape. 
So you're really looking for this very high powered, I used to call these folks two or three years ago purple squirrels because they don't exist, but they're starting to emerge. Um, uh, and I would argue that having a great sales operations person, when I say sales ops, that doesn't necessarily mean they report into sales. Many of them are, are, are marketing ops people. But I would argue that you could probably increase the effectiveness of your go-to-market strategy by 20% overnight by hiring a world-class sales ops, marketing ops person. Um, and I think this is going to be one of the biggest levers as you think about the next two to three to five years of, of work you have to do at the company you're at today or, or one that you'll be at the, you will be at the future. I believe companies that are embracing sales operations as a key strategic lever, not a, not, not a tactical, just make sure you know, the lead gets routed properly, but someone that understands APIs, integrations, um, systems, moving data between systems, um, analyzing closed lost, uh, not just close one, that type of person, and then building systems that allow that to uh, allow you to be incredibly data driven. Co companies that embrace this are going to be the leaders of their of their field. They are the next set of unicorns um, uh, as we move out into the next next decade or so of, of the work we do. Okay, now. Um, uh, Afford me three minutes, and I'm going to keep this to three minutes of, of the shameless plug uh, for HG Data. Um, I, I've tried to relay some information, which is very non-parochial. But given that that uh, we, we do believe HG Data does um, play a very big role or can play a very big role for tech companies, let me just go through very briefly what the heck HG Data does. HG Data has reverse engineered the softwares and hardwares in use um, by companies across the globe. There's a bunch of stats on this page. You can read them without me um, uh, going through it, going through it uh, item by item. But the basic point of the data set we've built is, we believe if you understand the uh, information about a company before you target them, before you do any outreach to them, you can be more effective. So understanding the products they, they have in place, understanding the attributes that define that company effectively. Um, we believe we're building the firmographics of the future. Um, stuff that you might be relying on today, number of employees, postal, revenue, we think those are gonna go the way of the buggy whip. And that um, we are gonna be able to build a, a map of, of what's of interest to a company that is much more rich, much more vibrant than the traditional elements um, you might be using uh, today. Um, how have we done this? This is actually, um, we actually do have rocket scientists that work for us. This actually is very uh, impressive. Um, we, we, don't, we don't do this by um, having uh, fingers on keyboards and, and brute force offshore labor. We've built these vibrant data sets through a very sophisticated data science uh, machine learning method. I could drop a whole bunch of jargon, but it doesn't really matter. Um, what we have done is we are actually listening to information that's put out in the public record. We've aggregated that information, the exhaust um, of press releases and news articles and job postings and resumes and a whole bunch of other stuff. We've collected that in a proprietary uh, corpus, and then we are running algorithms against it that is contextually aware, that helps, you, that helps us make the connections between a company using Salesforce, a company having a international shipping department, and a whole bunch of other type, uh, a company implementing a 401k plan. Um, we're able to, uh, to, to separate the signals from the noise by, by building a corpus of billions of documents and having the algorithms that can understand the contextual awareness of the text within that documentation. Ultimately, our data is used um, across all the departments. 
that are market facing. So it's used by marketing organizations. It's used by analytics teams. It's used by sales teams. It's used by customer success teams to do all kinds of sophisticated analysis on addressable market, on messaging, on upsell, cross-sell, uh, in their ABM and predictive uh, analytics strategies. Um, that's enough of the shameless plug. Um, let's move on to Q&A here and see if any of this uh, uh, dialogue has resulted in some questions or comments from those of you who have been listening. Thank you for joining. Um, we now have a few minutes to take questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to go and check and see what questions have come in. And we'll start there. If you do have questions, um, please enter them now. And let's get started with that, Mark, if you're ready. Absolutely. OK, great. Um, let's see. How do you define, you mentioned earlier in the presentation, this came in on the web, one of the questions. Um, how do you define first party data, Mark? Hmm. Well, I, I don't have a very complex definition of first party data. I mean, I mean, when I'm referring to it, what I'm talking about is, is information that's collected directly uh, by us as an organization, whether it be sales reps, keying in information into the CRM themselves based on accounts they're interacting with, um, whether it's trade show data that we've collected by scanning badges and, and are bringing into our, our system of record, whether it's um, sales data we have uh, from our client base, um, whether it's uh, information on web visitation that we're pulling off uh, our, our website, all that information is is um, is information that we procured uh, through our own personal efforts. And eventually, I guess the point the point is, third party data becomes first party data. <laughs> you know, after you've incorporated it and find value in it. But the distinction between first party data uh, and third party data is uh, internally generated versus uh, purchased by a third party that has that has created it uh, for various purposes. Okay. Thank you. We have another question about what you called the purple unicorn, the sales ops description. Um, could you share sort of a, a summary of what that job description looks like? Yeah, uh, purple squirrel is, uh, is, is the term I use that I've used <laughs> for years. But um, there really is a fascinating uh, constellation of skills that I'm seeing um, uh, come up in the generation one one decade below myself, <laughs> um, which is they have this really interesting set of um, you know market facing sales engineering skills, where they can talk to prospects, they they ask very good questions, they listen very well, they understand go to market strategy, but son of a gun they can code too, and. Uh, so, you know, going back to when I was starting my career, there was a very clear line between engineers were engineers. They tended to be back office folks that, you know, um, uh, you know, were, you know, never saw the light of day. And then you had these swashbuckling um, sales folks that could talk a good game, but, um, you know, needed help getting their email uh, or, or getting their they're VCR uh, programmed, <laughs> to use a personal example. Um, today, um, we're seeing much, much, much more technical folks that either aspire to be front of front office or vice versa. Um, and what that's a for, you know, uh, what's happening is is that sales and marketing is is in general is in general going from art to science. These people are, are, are becoming much more critical to the strategic execution, if not design, 
of uh, of a sales and marketing effort. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I'll take one more here that came in online, and then we'll see if there's any um, live questions. Um, we had a couple of questions actually about the process overall um, feeling very intimidating, this idea of really analyzing your funnel and um, <laughs> to, you mentioned cutting it by 90%. That's very intimidating. But just as, a, as any company wants to look at this process, where do you think they should start? Where should they start? Um, well, I guess like any 13-step uh, program, uh, admitting you have a problem is, is a good one. And I think most companies, when I say have a problem, I'm being a bit tongue-in-cheek. I mean, most companies are not yet strategically defining markets. Um, you know, the, the typical response to trying to drive more revenue is, well, let's just work harder. Let's put more cheeks in seats. Um, in one sense or the other, as opposed to being very um, thoughtful and prescriptive in how do you define your market? How, how, you know, how, how do you um, communicate with that precision at scale that, that I talk about? Now, now, the good news is, if I go back 10 years ago, the, the companies that were doing this were really only the billion dollar plus entities that had the ability to have um, offshore teams or, or build custom code, but there really has been a massive democratization of analytics tools. Um, uh, you know, and, uh, and a massive explosion of companies um, trying to fill the need here. So what I would do, um, one of the first things I would do is I would get cross-departmental support. Um, if I go back to the example I gave earlier of me being in this kind of um, almost linebacker role where I, I span marketing, sales, and product. You know, if any of you are listening in one of those three departments, and maybe there's a fourth or fifth analytics or, or something, um, getting support across the entire team that develops the go-to-market strategy, I think is important before you embark on one of these projects. Secondly, define success. What, is, what does success mean? Um, likely it's going to be very qualitative at first, but eventually should evolve into a quantitative um, uh, measurement. Um, folks might have heard the term um, uh, revenue-based marketing, uh, where in the past marketing was responsible for creating MQLs, and then once an MQL was created, they, you know, the, the finger pointing would start. Uh, marketing would blame sales, you know, you can't sell my leads. Sales would say the leads stink. Um, and, and, you know, you'd never get very far except this stalemate. Well, now marketing is becoming much more accountable to actually bookings results. And so I think it's important to define success of a project like this. And then, um, you know, I, there's lots of ecosystems out there that you can tap into. Talk to your peer group about what systems they've used and, and what solutions they've uh, embarked on, whether they be analytic solutions or predictive solutions or data analysis solutions or data append solutions. A quick Google search will probably turn up more vendors than you would ever want to, uh, you'd ever want to uh, investigate. Uh, and and I, one last tip before I shut up and get off my soapbox here is um, whatever vendors you talk to, probably the most important questions I would ask um, is, you know, can you, you know, can can you refer me to five of your clients and tell me the, you know, the use case or or the success story? And the reason I say that is, not only has the democratization happening happened in um, any any size company, you know, even startups, five, ten, fifteen, twenty million dollar uh, embryonic companies, not only have has have the barriers to entry in working with vendors in the predictive ABM space been brought down. But also the barriers that have been brought down to hang, hang out a shingle, you know, build a beautiful website and claim you're an ABM or predictive vendor. And uh, I think, um, you know, kind of holding their feet to the fire to, to make sure um, they're a viable entity uh, with a real product in a, uh, in, a, in a successful track record of delivering is, is the degree of scrutiny I would encourage anyone to uh, hold, hold a prospective vendor partner up against. 
Okay. Thanks, Mark. We have one last question here, which is sort of the flip side of the one you just answered, and then we'll we'll close. Um, what mistakes have you seen in this market that you might that might provide good? <laughs> well, well, I think some some of the things I just mentioned are based uh, upon scars on my back from having made some mistakes of not seeking consensus, not defining success. Um, uh, I think the other, um, uh, let me add one more, which is um, don't try to do too much too quickly. You know, uh, with, with this brave new world of uh, analytics and, you know, this tsunami of data, it can get very um, intoxicating to build an amazing system that you know qualifies leads, predicts your next customer, and you know um, almost like the mistakes of marketing automation, where where we thought if we just spam the world, and notice I'm saying we here, you know POs would show up at our door. I think it's important for us not to not to overhype um, what a ABM predictive analytics strategy will do for you. Nothing gets in the way of hard work. Nothing gets in the way of good product. Um, so I just think be cautious in your ambition. Set reasonable goals that are incremental from where you are today. If you were like most of the companies I've worked for in that F100 company um, I've, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time and, and don't claim that you are going to revolutionize the organization in a quarter or two or else you may find yourself looking for a job <laughs> by, by, uh, by, by uh, being overly ambitious or enthusiastic about expectations. Okay, looks like we've answered the questions from the audience. So um, for those of you who are still on the line, we just want to thank you um, for participating and feel free to contact us um, through the network if you have any further questions. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much, Barbara. Surely in the last year, you, you've heard the term ABM. Uh, and for those few on the phone that maybe haven't heard it, heard it, that stands for um, account-based marketing. Um, it's all the rage, and I think generally that's a good thing. What, what isn't a good thing is just about every MarTech and sales tech vendor that's been around for years in the last year has changed their website to say, we're the key to your ABM strategy. So what's happened is, you know, a concept um, that is taking hold right now um, is, is being confused or cluttered by everyone latching onto it uh, by saying, we're your ABM solution. Um, so to define ABM a, a little bit from, from my perspective, uh, and there are other vendors that can give you a much more comprehensive definition of ABM, I'll just define it very um, simply, which is uh, ABM is about targeting accounts with precision. It's about a rifle approach to how you define, um, you know, having uh, this blizzard of information is actually a, a scarier world. 20 years ago, when you didn't know who to call, who to talk to, how to figure out your addressable market, um, it, it was kind of easy because, you know, you could only find, uh, you had a paucity of leads. And so you would obviously go reach out to them. But now with all these tools that are in all this data that's allowing you to slice and dice and analyze your market in a, in a plethora of different ways, it's actually more, uh, it, it's almost a bit numbing or, or paralyzing because you can actually look at the market in so many different uh, fashions. So, um, not only do you need to listen uh, to the data, as this, this quote uh, talks about, but you need to figure out what subset of the data is, in, of data is important for you to pay attention to. So that in the blizzard of information, 
finding the, the nuggets of value is what all of us um, in the sales and marketing arenas uh, now aspire to do. Um, to very much a personal perspective on the hype uh, that is around ABM and predictive analytics right now. I'm certainly going to share with you HG Data's perspective on it, um, give you some real-world exam examples that draw upon my past and, and what we've seen uh, at HG Data, uh, certainly then uh, lead into a, a short and brief shameless plug uh, of HG Data at the end of the discussion, and then lead into our Q&A. Hopefully, we'll have a, a vibrant discussion of, of what topics are of interest uh, to all of you listening today. Um, as I said a minute ago, um, sales and marketing is really going through a uh, transition from, from art to science. Uh, Data-driven uh, is all the new rage. You go Google, Google that right now, and you'll find uh, you know, tens of millions of hits about data-driven marketing and data-driven sales and, and all different uh, focuses on how data should be the underpinnings of, of how you approach the market. Uh, what's interesting from my perspective is um, we're really going from an environment of scarcity of information to one of abundance. And to some degree... Good morning and thank you for joining us. This is Barbara Winters, Vice President of Marketing with HG Data. I'm here to introduce Mark Godley, our Chief Revenue Officer, who will be sharing our webinar, How to Turn Data into Sales. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Barbara, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this topic that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have made a career in the last decade of helping technology startups get into revenue. I'm somehow drawn to these very embryonic early stage companies that have great ideas, but uh, not many clients. Um, right now, I do work for HG Data, um, which uh, is an organiz organization that um, is at the forefront of uh, helping evolve the sales and marketing arenas uh, to be more uh, science oriented and those that are moving into the predictive analytics and the um, the ABM worlds uh, are finding that the data set that HE data has built uh, can, can be of significant value. Um, which leads to what we're going to talk about today. This is going to be in your market rather than a shotgun approach. But there's a key concept here. It's about pre precision at scale. And a, a key thing for, I want you to walk away from this discussion um, having uh, it, it, it internalized is years ago, having precision and scale was not possible. Um, they were oxymoronic. You could have one or the other. You could either target effectively and have an addressable market of five, or you could go after hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of prospects, but you had no ability to target them effectively. What we can now do because of the addition of data into the mix um, is you can actually have both precision and scale. Um, you know, my personal opinion is, ABM is uh, also the pendulum swinging back from the belief that many of us fell victim to um, in the last decade, that all you have to do is buy a, a, a email tool such as marketing automation um, 